Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Greg. I have on here with me today Cody Leibold. Cody Leibel is one of the founders of For the New Christian Intellectual, and he has been my writing coach and a mentor to me for a few years now. Um, Cody, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm married. I'm in my mid-30s. I have two kids, and I do some marketing work as well as the podcast that you referenced. That's at christianintellectual.com. And I have a pretty active social media presence in order to find people that would be good to discuss ideas, philosophy with, theology. I'm a Reformed Orthodox Christian, you know, little case, lowercase o Orthodox. And I, you know, it's over the last couple of years, I've got to know you because you have a lot of interest in common with me as far as apologetics and approaching Christianity from a rational point of view. And so, and that's, that's why I'm on social media. That's why I'm trying to build a community. It's, it's about enabling other people to promote Christianity in the way that the Bible actually teaches it, as opposed to a lot of versions that we hear out there today. You, you mentioned uh, approaching Christianity in a rational way, um, but a lot of people out there, they would uh, view faith as um, something that you feel, you know, it's something that, well, I, I believe in God because it feels good and uh, um, because, because of things like this. But when you say rational, uh, rational Christianity. For a lot of people, that doesn't go together. You know, tell us a little more about that. Well, people believe, many people believe that faith is believing something without proof. And if that's your concept of what faith is, then that does not agree with what the Bible says. You know, in John, it says, I wrote down all these miracles so that you can know. And the, the idea that we should know things creates a confusion in people's minds because they think, well, what about the Holy Spirit? Doesn't the Holy Spirit just convict our hearts and I say, well, yes, it does. And, and there's no way that somebody's going to become a Christian without the Holy Spirit convicting their heart and transforming them. That's not the question that we're discussing when we discuss whether Christianity is rational. I believe the Holy Spirit enables you to see that Christianity is rational. It, it allows you to cast off, it, it, the Holy Spirit himself casts off the chains that are on your heart. It changes, he changes your heart from being dead in sin to being alive and receptive to the truth. And so there's a moral inability and there's an intellectual inability. My understanding of this is that because we have a moral inability, because we love sin, it says in John 3, we don't want to come to the light. But the Holy Spirit gives us new life. That's what John 3 is about. We're reborn. And then we no longer love the deeds of darkness. We're able to love God. And then we're able to look at the evidence and we're able to see the most natural, rational conclusion. And that's all part of the Holy Spirit's work is enabling us to discern, to know that the claims of Christianity and of Jesus Christ are true. So there's, there's no competition between the idea of faith and rationality and the Holy Spirit, despite what people would think. The perspective that I'm outlining is not new. This would be the perspective of somebody like Thomas Aquinas, somebody like Jonathan Edwards, I'm relying on him a lot, and it would be the perspective of R.C. Sproul. So this contrasts with a lot of views out there right now, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of this view. I think it's, I'm a radical for this view. I think it's great, but it, it's not a new view. So your argument and what you, sounds like you want your audience to know is that Christianity is not about fideism. It's not about uh, faithism. It's not a faith that we believe because it feels good or because uh, we like to believe it, or because we felt a burning in our bosom. It's something that we can have a factual and rational foundation for, and that ultimately biblical Christianity is a uh, rational, factually based faith um, that somebody can say is objectively true. It's not just my opinion. It's something that um, an honest observer would say, yes, this is an objective, um, description of reality. Is that correct? That is correct. I believe that any honest observer would say that Christianity is true. And therefore, when people are not saying that it's true, it means that they are not being honest, especially if they're adults. I'm not necessarily talking about like a random five-year-old, hey, tell me who Jesus is. And I'm not going to have, there's, no, there's not that sense of accountability because maybe he has not yet reached the age where he understands moral concepts. But it, in Romans 1, it does say that the all people, whether they've heard scripture or not, it talks about all people, the wrath of God is revealed against all of them. 
And that's the basis of that wrath that God has toward them is that they have denied, they've suppressed the knowledge of God that they have that has been revealed to them through the things that have been made. If you especially look at Romans 1.20. And so there's, a, there's an ongoing debate about what does that mean? The knowledge that we have of God from the things that have been made. And, you know, Greg, is cool. Just today, I was listening to a recording that we made two years ago where it was your very first time that we did a Zoom with, <clears throat> sorry, with you and me and with Jacob and, uh, and several other people. And we were talking about these same topics. And so it reminds me, wow, this is really cool that we've been able to have this discussion for so long. And I hope we're getting better at it. We're getting better at putting it in people's faces and saying, you, you should know what this discussion is. You should make a choice about this. I think you and Jacob have definitely come a long way with it. I, have, I mean, you guys were, were amazing from the start, um, but you could see those, uh, we do the railroad analogy, um, since we're both uh, fans of the, the train book that well, I'll bring up a little later. It's almost like you kind of tro- had a little bit of a rough start on the track, but it seems like you guys have gotten smoother and smoother with your presentation um, as you've grown and developed. And for those of you who don't know, Jacob Brunton is, um, from what I understand, the other founder of For the New Christian Intellectual. Uh, Cody and Jacob are co-founders, if I understand correctly. Um, and by the way, all my articles on Medium, most of them are published through For the New Christian Intellectual, if you guys want to go check those out. But I've definitely seen them come a long, long way. Um, so you mentioned Romans 1. Um, I saw a debate that you and Jacob have gotten into with um, some famous uh, theologians and apologists where, you know, you were pointing out, hey, you know what, natural theology or um, general revelation can tell us a lot about who God is and about his uh, qualities and properties. And somebody came back to you as a, a theologian who said, or, or an apologist who said, no, um, you know, Rome from Romans 1, the only thing we can know about God is that he exists. That's all we can know about God from from natural theology or from general revelation. You can't know anything else about God from general revelation. You and Jacob pointed out that from Romans 1, there's a lot that you can know about God just from general revelation. Um, Romans 1 says that men are without excuse to not know certain things about God, um, contrary to what this apologist said. Now, feel free to tell us about that. So he had said that you can know that there is a God and that he's worthy of praise or something like that. You can see the article is at christianintellectual.com slash presuppositionalism. And the article is called How I Got from Alpha to Omega because I made some very broad claims and then I was criticized. And so this is my response to that criticism. So the, the passage in Romans 1, it describes the fact that people have moral knowledge, that they know that it's wrong to murder, that they know that certain sexual practices are wrong. They also know many other things, including that it's wrong to hate your parents and and treat them badly. And there's a whole list of sins in there. And it it just assumes that people know all of these things are wrong. And it's in this context, it's referring to people that do not have access to any of God's written words or preaching of it. So how do they know? And the historical position on this, which I think that the presuppositional apologists don't understand is that we are able to infer facts about right and wrong from observation of the world around us. This is how Paul characterizes it in Romans 1, in Acts 14, in Acts 17. This is when when Paul is talking to Gentiles. He tells them, this is the way the world is. He speaks about the heavens and the earth and the rains and, and the seasons And he speaks about the fact that people are able to farm and they're able to have wealth and then God gives them joy. And Paul positions our knowledge of God that everybody should have in terms of you observe some things about the world and about man, about society, about the way we interact in that world. And from that, you should know. If you were not suppressing, you would know. You chose not to know is Paul's argument. And it's for that, that's the reason why you are morally condemned. That's not a a novel interpretation of those passages. That's the orthodox position on those passages and on the idea, which we call natural theology, which is the, the knowledge that we have of God based on what he revealed generally, not specifically in scripture. Yeah, that's uh, something I want to talk about a little more. 
Um, one thing I definitely found interesting with your ministry is, uh, for me, somebody who's done a lot of creation apologetics, most of what I've been exposed to has been, did I cut out just now? You're good. Okay. And that, that's interesting because for, as somebody who's done a lot of creation apologetics, uh, one thing I've really noticed is there is a lot of presuppositionalism um, that is really pushed in creation-based ministries. And I don't think anybody necessarily means, means ill by doing that, but I didn't, I didn't ever know that there was another way to think of things. Um, and I think I misunderstood a lot of what was being said. But you guys have pointed out that um, a lot of what the presuppositionalists have said, if we're looking at classical, or if we're looking at Vantillian um, presuppositionalists, if we're looking at the people who have really founded this idea, is they kind of almost argue that you can't know anything about morality unless you have a Bible. Um, you can't really have any access to knowledge unless you have a Bible. I mean, they almost make it sound like you can't know that murder is wrong unless you've actually had a Bible and you can't know the two plus two equals four unless you have first assumed that a rational God oversees the universe. Um, do you, do you think that's a, a fair assessment and uh, how uh, of presuppositionalism um, and how would that compare to, uh, to classicalism? It is a fair assessment. There was a quote from, uh, I believe it was from R.C. Sproul's book where they said that what Van Til confesses to in one sentence he takes back in another or something like that. And so this is a perennial problem that is recognized both by people that are favorable and people that are opposed to Van Til. And, and the pattern is that he is saying that people in one sense do have knowledge and that people in one sense do not have knowledge. For example, moral knowledge, or, but it could be mathematical knowledge or it could be knowledge of anything. But take moral knowledge, the idea that murder is wrong. He will say in some sense they do know it, and in some sense, they do not know it. And the, I think there's an equivocation or there's an ambiguity going on somewhere. And this is how it works. They will say it would, be, it would lead to a contradiction or it would be a, a self-contradictory worldview altogether considered if you were to say murder is wrong and also there is no God. Or if you were to say murder is, is wrong and I know it and also there is no God. Now, as a classicalist, as somebody within the Orthodox tradition on apologetics and epistemology, I say, you know, you're right. If you know that there are true things about the world, like the idea that murder is wrong or the idea that there's a lamp in front of me or whatever, if you know anything, then it is implied that there was some cause of that. Congratulations, you've just rediscovered the cosmological argument. Now, if what you're, and that's a classical argument from Aquinas and from others before, so if all you're saying is that the fact that we have knowledge points to the fact that there was a creator, we agree with you. But somehow we get the idea that that's not what they're saying. Because what they seem to be saying is, no, you're not even entitled to say that you have knowledge unless you admit that there is a creator. And therefore, when you say that murder is wrong, you don't actually know that because you don't already admit that there is a creator. You have that knowledge in some capacity and you're suppressing it and therefore it has implications on all of the rest of your view. So that even something as simple as murder is wrong, that is knowledge that you're holding in some way incorrectly. The classicalist would come back and say, well, sure, you may be holding it in some way incorrectly. For example, the truth is that if you kill someone, you're murdering God's person. And somebody who's an atheist doesn't know that they would just know that killing is wrong, but they don't necessarily know the full implications of it. They, they don't know the full context. Well, we acknowledge that. But there is this going back and forth among the Ventilians where they will say, you do have knowledge, but also you don't have knowledge. And we're not clear. And we keep on asking them. I, you know, I've asked some of the best. Can you explain what this means? We do not get an answer. And the reason why we do not get an answer is because once they commit to an answer, then they will either have classified themselves as agreeing in every way with classicalists or as being fideists. It's a fork and they don't want to have to choose that fork. It sounds like a lot of times they do what uh, you see the Darwinians do where um, uh, Darwinians will say, oh, well, uh, there's natural selection, therefore that proves evolution. Um, but they, they completely 
um, forget that it was actually originally a creationist uh, named Edward Blythe who first came up with the idea of natural selection um, and that basically nobody has ever really denied that species change in the first place. So um, I see kind of the same thing with presuppositionalists that I see with evolutionists. And, you know, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like a lot of times presuppositionalists, they'll say, oh, well, here's, you know, these really interesting points. And then they want to try to claim that for presuppositionalism, but those are points that classicalists and objectivists would agree with them on. They would say, yes, we agree with those points. Those are part of um, classical epistemology as well and part of, um, of uh, objectivist epistemology. Um, you guys have talked about argument, um, argumentum ad absurdum. Uh, I'm messing up the Latin there, but it, you know, an argument to the absurd. Um, you guys have have uh, pointed out that that's not exclusive to presuppositionalism. That's actually um, um, that's actually part of classicalism and classical logic. Um, and with that, I, I wanted to kind of give you a slight curveball a little um, with this to uh, try to throw a question in there. So as somebody with, you know, a lot of, with, with me, I have a lot of background doing a lot of the creation apologetics, and they will point out that, hey, um, in a Darwinian world, um, in a Darwinian worldview, you, the, the logical implication might be that eugenics is a good thing or eugenics is something that you should do. Um, so if you have a pure Darwinian worldview um, and you, you look at all those implications, you would definitely, it would definitely come to some uh, disturbing conclusions. And this is something that uh, people like Richard Dawkins and um, you know, other great evolutionists would, would really acknowledge. Um, and it's something that even Darwin acknowledged to an extent. Um, yeah, human beings somehow know that murder is wrong. Um, and so even if you're an evolutionist, you would know, hey, murder is wrong, but um, that doesn't quite fit logically into my worldview. And, you know, that has given us a lot of problems throughout history. You see that with, uh, with Nazism and communism. Um, is this something you'd have any particular um, insight into or um, how, how would this relate to classicalism versus presuppositionalism? Um, hope that's not too much, but go for it. We hear this argument a lot, which is that you can't account for morality at all, objective morality, unless you believe that there is a God. And I will go one further than that. And I'll say you can't account for believing anything unless there's a God. You cannot account for the fact that right here, I'm sitting, unless you trace it back and you say, well, it came about some way. And the only way that something that is contingent and something like myself, a creature, can come into being is if something that was not contingent created it. That's the logic of the cosmological argument. So this, I, this focus on morality, it's, it makes for a compelling rhetorical argument because people do want to know, well, where did morality come from? And so it's fine to say to people, you believe that there's right and wrong. Doesn't that suggest that there's a God? I mean, that's, that's fine. But these people that say that if evolution were true, I don't believe evolution is true at all, by the way. But these people that say that if, if evolution were true, then therefore it would follow that eugenics is okay. I don't see that being a logically coherent position. I, why? Why would the evolution in the past and the, the means by which we came to be what we are change our perception of what in fact we are today? and what in fact we ought to do today. I think that you can argue for objective morality for the truth of it, even if you were an evolutionist. And in fact, here's what the way I think the conversation should go. Let's say I were talking to somebody who is an atheist and an evolutionist. I would say to them, let's talk about objective morality. Do you believe that there is objective morality? And if they end up saying yes, then I'm not gonna be like, well, on your evolutionary theory, you can't have that because evolution makes that impossible. I'm not even gonna talk about evolution. I'm going to say, you believe that there is such thing as right and wrong, and you have all this knowledge of that, you have all this knowledge of human life. You know for sure that we are here right now. You know that, where did we come from? And I will use that to point to God. I'm not gonna to try to tell him that he ought to, on his premises, stop believing in some true thing. I'm gonna tell him that 
these premises, which are correct, point to a different true thing. So it's a positive way of arguing. It's arguing from what we do know to something else that you should know. It's different from a negative way of arguing, which is what the presuppositionalists do, which is they simply say, neener, neener, if you don't accept all of my arbitrary claims, because I say so, then therefore you're not entitled to make any of your claims. See, it's entirely negative. That I, I don't think that that is a masculine way of arguing. I don't think it's a virtuous way of arguing. And so that's why I do it in a positive way. So like if you were talking to somebody like Richard Dawkins or to, um, um, or to Stephen Jay Gould, you might say the fact that morality exists points to the fact that God exists. Is that correct? Or am I misrepresenting correct. that? Okay. So I think that's very, that's very interesting because like a lot of the presuppositionals will point out, Hey, um, if they were being consistent within their worldview, you'd have a lot of problems uh, with um, what we know to be true about morality. Um, and it sounds like you would agree with that, but um, you would say, hey, you know that murder is wrong. You know that uh, certain sexual behaviors are wrong. You know that um, theft is wrong. This really points to a moral God creating the universe rather than having to assume there's a God a priori and then all of the iterations coming from there to derive um, the morality, which God has made obvious to all men. I saw a meme where a well-known presuppositionalist, he says, that's a nice worldview you've got there. And then it zooms in on him, you know, and it says, it'd be a shame if someone wrecked it. And that's not why we're here. People already have a decent understanding of many true things. That's what Romans 1 tells us. That's what Acts 14 and 17 tell us. Build on that. And that's not an insult to the Holy Spirit to give a good argument. What's your alternative to give a bad argument? Hmm. That, sound, that sounds like a very Mars Hill uh, way of approaching things. It's like, hey, you guys all, you know, with Paul talking to people on Mars Hill, he said, well, you guys already know the divine exists. You're already very religious, um, you know, good for you, but let me try to tell you who God is more accurately and who this unknown God is, um, you know, rather than, you know, neener, 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 you know, this thing about Zeus and this other story about Zeus contradict one another. Um, it seems like he was very focused on, hey, let me try to get, and, and obviously there's, there's a place for pointing out contradiction within somebody's worldview, but the focus should be going more towards the truth and towards uh, that, that positive view of the world. Yes, that is X 17 is the Mars Hill discussion. Awesome. So, um, Bringing this to, to the next thing, you guys have talked a um, lot about Christian egoism and um, you, know, you guys have uh, Ayn Rand as one of the, the big people who um, you see as inspiration. Now, this, this is somebody who I had maybe heard of once before I talked to you guys. Um, I think I, I saw a meme. It was, uh, well, today's Ayn Rand's birthday. Go eat in a whole cake in front by yourself in front of a homeless person. And I, obviously, I didn't know who Ayn Rand was. I didn't even know Ayn Rand was a woman at the time. But I, I recognized that this was a parody. This was a joke. That this was probably not something that anybody actually believed. Um, yet most Christian philosophers are very opposed to Ayn Rand. Um, so go ahead and tell us about that. Tell us about Christian egoism and tell us about uh, Ayn Rand. Sure. The way to understand what we're doing with Ayn Rand's ideas is to point out that if Ayn Rand pointed, if she had some useful thing to say about how concepts work or about how the political system in the United States works, we can evaluate her arguments each individually. You can also evaluate her system as a whole and you can critique it. You can say, I accept it 100% or I accept it with caveats or I don't accept her system as a whole. Now, Jacob Brunton and I have been accused of accepting Ayn Rand's system as a whole, especially her epistemology, and then of saying, oh, well, let's try to squeeze Christianity into that system. So that's the kind of critique that, you know, if, if you're a Christian and you're out there saying, hey, you should read somebody who's not a Christian, you should expect that kind of critique. I will say this, Ayn Rand's epistemology impressed me. So here's something to understand is that as I learned epistemology, I started with Ayn Rand, and then I learned about other systems. Jacob started with other systems, and he learned about classical epistemology, about R.C. Sproul, 
And then he learned about Ayn Rand eventually and he realized, oh, they're very much similar. So we have a different appreciation of Ayn Rand, I do and Jacob does. And so some people will say, well, Cody, you once said you learned a lot from Ayn Rand, but Jake, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, just everybody's different in, in what they learned and in what order they learned. Mm -hmm. the, the importance of epistemology is something that I gained from Ayn Rand and the importance of understanding ethical categories like axiology and applied ethics, knowing what those consist of. I've gained a lot from her. They are not found exclusively in her. They are also found in Aquinas, in Augustine, they're found in Christians more recently as well. Uh, so for example, this idea of rational egoism, you find that in Gordon Clark, if you look for it, he's a precept guy, but you'll still find it. It's very clear. And you'll find it in John Piper. And uh, I think that Jacob encountered Piper before he ever encountered Rand. So there's, there's a history of ideas. And it's helpful if we can acquaint ourselves with that history and then think independently about which, which parts of it are worth chewing and which parts are bones worth spitting out. That really reminds me of, um, you know, Jacob told, tells a story about how when he began studying philosophy, there, he ran into this issue within the church where people would look at him like he had 10 heads or something saying, well, why would you want to study philosophy? You know, what, what good is philosophy? What good is any philosopher um, who isn't explicitly a, you know, born again Christian with, um, you know, who's a five point Calvinist or whatever. Um, and to me, I, I thought that was, you know, one of the saddest things I had ever heard because, um, you know, the apostle Paul, he, he cited Plato. I mean, he used Plato in his arguments to point people to Christianity. You know, you read the Bible, he references Plato. Like, so we can't have anything to do with a philosopher who isn't a Christian, you know, be it Plato or be it Ayn Rand. I, I find it absolutely absurd. Um, and as somebody who went to school for science, uh, very few of my uh, professors were Christian, if any. Um, so most of what I have learned about microbiology and biochemistry, it really points to God. It really, like, it amazes me how by the time I got through my fourth year of college, I, I was just like, you know what, I don't any, understand how anybody can study four years of biochemistry, molecular biology, uh, genetics, and uh, cell biology, and not at least suspect the hand of a creator. So it really did point to God. Um, and, you know, when Jacob was telling his story, um, I, I found it quite, I found it very, very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit more about, um, I want to ask you a little bit more about Ayn Rand. So one of her big things that you guys have agreed with is she wrote an essay called The Virtue of Selfishness. And in the book Atlas Shrugged, um, this was one of the big things is that, you know, a man ought to take care of himself. But in the Western world, we have this idea, this idea that we get from Kant that um, selfishness is a bad thing. Um, and that has appeared in many Bible translations since the time of Kant. Um, feel free to tell us a little bit about that. I know you have a whole video on that that is a little more than what we can get into in full here. There is preached from almost every pulpit in the country in the United States this year, the idea of death to self, the idea of self-sacrifice as being a moral good thing. And that is an idea that came to us from Immanuel Kant and from others before him and after. C.S. Lewis pointed it out. He says, if you want to talk about morality today, most people think, well, don't be selfish. But C.S. Lewis says morality is about doing good things, not about refraining from doing things. It, and it's about action. It's, it's not about self-renunciation. If you believe that human life is good, you pursue the ends of human life. And which life have you been given responsibility for? Your own. And so your main, uh, your main attention should go to the needs of this self that God has given you. That doesn't mean we don't care about other people. But there's foundational questions within ethics. And one of the foundational questions is, should your ethics be egoistic or should it be altruistic? Those are the terms that we would use. And an altruistic ethics is one which does treat self-sacrifice for its own sake. 
as being the standard for what is moral or what's not. It's, it doesn't work as a system because it doesn't actually tell you what's good or what's not good. It just says the good is that which is good for others. So it's empty, but it's also wrong. It's just incorrect that we ought to seek self-sacrifice. Some people have found these ideas, they think they found them in scripture. You know how Jesus went to the cross and he's an example of a literal sacrifice. But he went to the cross for the sake of the joy that was set before him. And he despised the suffering and the shame. And he did what he did so that he could gain for everyone that would believe in him life so that he could bring glory to the Father and so that he could have a, a people for himself that would worship him. It's a glorious thing and it was self-interested for him to do it. And when we choose to worship him, we do it because we see life in him. Some people have looked at John the Baptist and they've said, oh yeah, that one time John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. And they've taken that as, as if that were the recipe for how to glorify God in all situations. It's not. John the Baptist was simply talking about that one situation, his ministry needed to decrease. And Jesus's ministry, his following needed to increase at that time. That was the plan. That was the purpose. That's not to say that I should go around seeking to decrease myself as if that would naturally glorify God. It, it simply doesn't. Yeah, that's something I, I really appreciate because like before I came across your ministry, um, I thought that the ideal of morality was that my whole life was meant to be devoted to self-sacrifice for the sake of others. And I didn't think that there was any other, it didn't even occur to me that there could be another view of morality, that um, there could be a positive uh, egoism, a positive a uh, view of quote unquote selfishness, um, which isn't you know a total disregard for other people, but it's hey, it is good to take care of your own life. It is good to go out there and uh, make money. It is good to go out there and uh, pay your bills and build a house and you know all that sort of thing. Um, but it seems like modern day evangelical Christianity is typically um, that the pinnacle of of um, virtue is going and being a self-sacrificial minister um, missionary to the poorest people, basically being a evangelical Mother Teresa, and the pinnacle of of uh, evil is you know somebody who has gone and built their corporate empire, even though you know because they're doing it for themselves, even though they have provided arguably for m many more people than the Mother Teresa figure. And it's probably him that's funding the Mother Teresa figure. Um, so uh, par pardon the opining there, because it's supposed to be you being interviewed, not me. But um, I, I definitely want to say I I've definitely learned a lot from your ministry and learned that, hey, um, there is different ways to think about morality. Um, taking care of yourself is not inherently a bad thing. Like go to the gym, eat those carrots, um, you know, go get that degree you know, those things might be quote unquote selfish, but those are good things. Um, selfishness doesn't necessarily mean, selfishness and egoism don't def necessarily mean a disregard for other people. Um, and you and I were also talking about the uh, verses in the Bible that uh, talk about quote unquote selfishness, but the actual word in Greek that isn't selfish, it's basically contentiousness. You know, it was arrogant and contentious and just wants to argue and cause problems. Um, this is not somebody who is taking care of himself and having a good life. Um, and you and Jacob have a, a longer video on that. Um, is there anything else you want to say along those lines before I uh, possibly move on to another topic? Well, I want to point out that it is natural, given where we are in history and the teaching that has come to us from the church and from a lot of outside sources as well, novels and the people that make culture, it's natural that when people read the Bible, they would see certain aspects in it that look like, oh, the Kantian system of ethics is the one that is coming from the Bible. So what I would encourage people to do is, is just be willing to rethink it. Be willing to look at each of those passages. Like, for example, when Paul says, it's better to give than to receive. Wait a minute, did you memorize that incorrectly? Because I think Paul says it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's a lot of little things where you read the Bible wrong or your preacher read it wrong. And it, it never hurts to be willing to think independently about it. I think people uh, confuse the Apostle Paul with a 
Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or Santa Claus or something or other. Um, so what are some of the other things your, your ministry does? Um, I, is there anything else you want to tell the audience about um, that your ministry likes to focus on? Um, we definitely covered a lot so far. We are focused on rational Christianity for those who love their lives. So you've got in there the idea of epistemology and you've got in there the idea of human motivation, the foundations of ethics, loving your life, living it well. And we go further than that as well into the realm of politics and we have positions on political theory. So we'll, we'll talk about economics. We'll talk about capitalism, which we advocate 100% laissez-faire capitalism. We advocate returning to generally speaking, the view of the founding fathers in the constitution. So if somebody's interested in that, I think the unique thing that we provide is we show how the battle for preserving the vision of the American founding fathers is not going the way it should. And the reason why is partly because of those other foundational issues. Because the Republicans today very clearly have embraced self-sacrifice for its own sake and altruism. And they've embraced a collectivistic idea of society, a concept of of how people should interrelate. And so that floods into the political theory and it ends up with the Republicans passing socialized medicine or something like that. And uh, so that you can see these issues, they're all philosophical issues, they're all fundamental issues, they're all related, going from epistemology to ethics to politics. And we want to speak about all of those and show how you can have an integrated view of scripture and of general revelation which would, I would say it's, it, it's almost like saying an integrated philosophy slash theology and how you can speak intelligently about all these topics. We want to equip people to understand how to, how to think about those topics. And we also want to equip people to build their own platforms. Our, our website is called for the new Christian intellectual for somebody else. We're trying to equip people by showing, Hey, it's not all that hard to make videos. Here's some of the ideas you should talk about. And here's some strategies if you wanted to even generate income to do it, or if you wanted to grow your audience, here are some things that we could do. So we've got a system for that as well. And it, it's all easy to find at our website. I guess that's uh, one of the big points that uh, people sometimes object to with your ministry is you have, um, and I think it's one of your strongest points, you've pointed out that you know, as Bible-believing Christians, um, we should be supporting capitalism and we should not be voting for Democrats. The, the Democrat party is, the, the Democrat party is, is, is evil and what they, what they are promoting is evil. And for, um, pastors to stand in the pulpit and say, oh, well, we can, you know, vote for whomever, whether they want to kill babies or, or, um, push, you know, free healthcare or whatever the case may be. Um, you, you've said that, Hey, these pastors need to step down. These, these are not pastors. Um, and, and that it is unacceptable for, for Christians, especially, you know, knowledgeable Christians to be, to be promoting these things. It's, you know, biblically, we should be having a capitalist type economy, um, and we should not be voting Democrat. Um, is, is that a fair assessment? In my capacity as a member of the council or leadership on a 501c3, what I can say is that pastors should not be supporting any political candidate who is pro-abortion, and pastors should be telling their churches not to do that. Being a 501c3, uh, in the capacity of a representative of that organization, I, I probably need to start learning how to talk less about specific candidates and about specific parties, but I will still talk about them on my personal social media. Gotcha. So you, you can't say anything in uh, the context of the 501c3 representative uh, for an organization, but on a personal level, you can say a lot more against particular candidates. Yep. And particular parties. And gotcha. I can and I do. Awesome. So um, do you have any, um, where can people find you? Um, you mentioned for the New Christian Intellectual, uh, the website. Um, you're also on Medium and on YouTube uh, and Twitter. Um, where else can people find you? Everything is easily findable at christianintellectual.com. You just go down to the bottom of it and it'll say, you know, here's Facebook page and those things. And you can also find my own professional services on building your email list or growing your social media presence or helping you with your writing. And that is at codylibolt.media. 
between those two websites, you'll be able to find pretty much anything that you can find. Uh, you know, like if you wanted to go to our YouTube channel, go to christianintellectual.com slash YouTube and we've set up redirects and stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, well, and I could definitely say, you know, for those of you who are interested, um, Cody has definitely helped me to grow my platform. He's definitely helped me to grow my audience. Um, I think my audience has more than doubled since uh, teaming up with Cody. And um, in terms of uh, writing, Cody has been an excellent writing coach. Uh, Cody and Parker have uh, been my two writing coaches for a couple of years now. Parker more with the uh, Parker J. Cole more with the um, sci-fi side of things and Cody more with the uh, nonfiction side of things. So anyway, thank you everyone for uh, joining us on this video. Um, Cody, do you have any final words to say to the audience? Well, I want to say thank you, Greg. It's wonderful to have friends out there that are thinking about these same topics, even if on not every topic we would agree with each other. The idea that we can work together to put true ideas out there in front of other people, it's so encouraging. I think this is something that everybody struggles with is intellectual isolation. If you're the kind of person that's a creative or a writer or whatever, and uh, you are out there connecting people. So I applaud you for that. And if if I could give some word of advice to anybody watching this, why don't you become somebody like Greg? And why don't you be somebody like me and all of the other people that I know where we're, we're intentional about this. If it matters, think about getting in the game. Awesome. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us, Cody. And uh, uh, for all of you out there watching this video, definitely um, subscribe to my channel um, and hit that little bell. Um, you can also subscribe to my email list and the Cody's email list. Um, both will be in the description box on both channels. Um, and if you haven't subscribed to Cody's channel, definitely go subscribe. Go subscribe to his email. He's got a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, if you want to hear more about um, science, apologetics, and the Bible, um, and about economics and science fiction, come to my channel and join my email list. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. This is Greg out.